wisdom of the Spirit, guidance from the Word. You should have your notes. There will be three sheets this week. All right. Pray. Father, thank you, Lord, just for the evening, for our time together, for your great grace in our life, Father. We just always, always pray for the word, Lord, that we would just go through it and and be reminded of things that we've read before, find things that are new, and Lord, um, maybe clarification and, and even a further understanding, Lord, of that which we've seen. So help us, Lord, especially in this day in which we live and at a time as this, Lord, such a changing culture, such a um, hostile culture towards you and your word and your will. So, Lord, we pray as believers, as men of God, that, Lord, we can live in this culture according to your word, that we could be an influence, that we could be salt, that we could be light. And, Lord, if we hold fast to your word and, and stick to it and abide in it, Lord, we, we could be that light we want to be. So thank you for your word again tonight. Thank you for my brothers that are here, those that could make it be with them, Lord, just... Uh, Remind them of your presence right now, Father, no matter where they're at, whether they're home or traveling or working, wherever, Lord, that they would just be thinking of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in Titus chapter 2 tonight. Paul quoted last week a, a Cretan philosopher. He called him one of their own prophets. Epiphanitis, 600 years before Jesus. And he made the statement that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And Paul said there in verse 13, that testimony is true. So for at least 700 years, that had been the culture of the island of Crete. That, that's the way they lived and the way they thought. The believers who grew up on Crete we're part of that culture. Just like you. I don't know what kind of culture you lived in before you came to Jesus. We all had some sort of a lifestyle. We lived in a culture. We had a world's view of how things were and should be. Could have been anything from a what used to be a Christian culture that we had in America. You could have been a hippie, a lowrider. You could have been a square. You could have been a geek. Could have been a Collegiate, who knows what you were. But we all came from a, a culture. What, what were you, Mike? Yeah. All the above. <laughs> kind of a, mix, a mixture of everything, huh? I like it. And so, like them, we grew up living our life looking through the lens of the culture. Everything we saw was in the light of the culture and the current mindset and beliefs and behaviors. And this is what was going on there, and that's why Paul had told Titus to rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith because it shows how far away from the will of God they were in that lifestyle. And now as they became Christians, these teachers and the Christians in Crete were still living in that cultural mindset. They hadn't broke away. So Paul says you got to rebuke them sharply. They need to be sound. They need to be healthy in the faith, in the truth, in the things of God. So the church was not doing good on the island of Crete, and the people, the way they were believing and living, wasn't good. Again, always liars, he said. When I read that in my mind, it simply tells me that they did not have a love or a respect for truth, especially God's truth. And we find that in Romans chapter 1, and we find it again in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where Paul talks about those who do not love the truth, who uh, suppress the truth, who lie against the truth. And so when he says they were always liars, they knew what was true, but they wanted to believe something else. He says they were evil beasts. And we talked about it last week. You know, that they, they were giving themselves to their base nature, not living much higher than the animals. They were just doing whatever they wanted. They were just meeting their need, fulfilling their pleasure, their desires. 
and uh, and that's the nature of man, just the sensual wants that he has. And then they were lazy gluttons. Obviously, self-seeking pleasure, loving, let's not work, let's kick back, let's eat, feast. Probably can include drinking in that, I'm sure. And so really, they were just pleasure lovers. So that's the characteristic of that culture. With those things, no doubt, that also shapes the rest of the way they see life. Okay, so always lying, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, but that always trickles into everything else in life that would affect the way they viewed themselves as individuals. That would affect the way they viewed marriage. That would affect the way they viewed family. It certainly affected the way they were as workers, lazy gluttons, not much of a worker, pleasure seekers, fun-oriented kind of people, not really interested in the truth. So those things would just kind of fall into all of their lives. The church here was going from a godless to a godly direction. When the gospel went out into the world, except in the Jewish community, and the Jewish community had Judaism, so there was a faith system in Israel. But in the rest of the world, it was a godless culture. There was idolatry. There were people who served a variety of gods sometimes, not just one god. When you study and you see what they were doing with these gods, it, it was just pagan and immoral, and there was debauchery, and there was just all kinds of stuff that we look at. And we go, you call that religion and, and, and faith, and, and you believed in a god, and he allowed that, and, and that's what it was. So it went from godly, and now they were becoming a, a godless into a godly culture. What's the challenge for you today and for me today is we're going from what was a godly culture, and we've moved now into a godless culture. There was a time in my life, and as I look around the room, pretty much every one of you, you lived in what was a Christian nation. America still had a Christian moral fabric to our culture. We weren't all Christians. People weren't born Christians. There's a little box right there, pagan Christian. You, you check the Christian box, and now you're a believer in Christ. Oh, no, not at all. Some people think that because they were born in America, and the reason why they thought that is because America was by all intents and purpose, as we had been since the founding, a nation who believed in the God of the Word. We had a, a Judeo-Christian ethic in our culture. And, and our laws were based on that. And, and a lot of what we did was based upon those truths. And in our lifetime, we have watched it go to a post-Christian nation and we've become a very, and are becoming even more, a very godless nation. And that's the struggle that we're having, watching us move away from something that, that had potential to something that is just, we're in disbelief sometimes, you know, sitting inside the, the kitchen here a little bit earlier, you know, you, you kind of talk about some of the things that are going on and what our nation believes and what we endorse and what we promote, where our values lie, and, and we look at that. And, and, and we want to say, time out, stop, where are you going? How in the world can you think like this? It's because our nation and our leaders are, are putting away the word of God. They're, they're rejecting the things of God. And because the people are rejecting the things of God. But I suggest to you, too, it's because the churches, too. When I say churches, I'm speaking in general, the Protestant church, not every church, but just such a large number of churches are putting away the authority of the Word of God, uncontested authority, that God has given His Word, God is the author of truth, and the church is to be the defender of His Word. Paul said in uh, 1 Timothy the church was what? The pillar and the ground of truth. Jesus said to the Father, Thy Word is truth. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. So this is being negotiated. This is being reconsidered by churches, Protestant churches, mainline denominations, denominations that used to be cutting edge front runner, runners within the Christian community. But unfortunately, the, the pressure of the culture is coming in and we're seeing a lot of change right there. As it was then, so it's Become now, many profess to know God, as we saw in verse 16 of last week's study. 
but in their works they deny him. They're described as even abominable, disobedient, and disqualified. And we talked about in Matthew 7, where Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did mighty works in your name. And he'll say, never knew you. Depart from you, workers. Remember, go to hell. He's the only one who can say that. Go to hell. Depart, go. And you look at that and you go, wait a minute. You, you, you prophesied in his name? Works were done, miracles? These things, demons were cast in the name? So you see that in their faith practice, there was some Jesus in there because they said, Lord, Lord. But what happens is there was enough compromise, there was enough lie, and there was enough of their culture within their faith system that Jesus said, I'm not your Lord. You call me Lord, Lord, he said, but you do not do those things that I tell you. What does the word Lord mean? It's up for definition. Steve Garver. Lord, what does it mean? Give me a... Okay. Master? Dave? Master? Anybody else? Who is it? Owner? Anybody else? Leader? Yep. Ultimate authority. Ooh, now you're going high. I like that. We don't use the word Lord in our culture. That is a, a, it's a 18th century, a 19th century word. So we, we just don't, who do you call Lord except for Jesus, right? And the problem with that is we don't appreciate the word that is used in the translation. The word master will get us a little bit closer. Uh, because of our culture, we, we tend to shy away from terminology that has that kind of ultimate authority vested in it because nobody has ult we, we don't use that word but but that is a good one ed when jesus says i'm the lord i am the ultimate authority i'm the only authority and i have full authority over your life i am your lord when, when you see that word and you say lord lord you're saying you have all authority paul said you are not your own you have been bought with a price therefore glorify christ in your body so i'm not my own well who then is the ultimate authority of this life the Lord, Jesus. Hey, I like that. That's what my computer does. Must be following me. Uh, the closest we have to that word, it actually even goes back to, to the days in, in our own nation, back into the 1800s, to the times of slavery. The Lord would be the Lord of the, of the uh, plantation, and then you would have the servants, the slaves. And that's how that word is used. You got the Lord, you, you got the servant, the slave. So we're the servants to Jesus Christ. So when he says, you know, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do it. I do. You don't believe. And that's why you hear so much about stay with the word of God. It's a good place to be. Doesn't need revision. God's not out of touch. He's not irrelevant. It's a good place to be. Let him be Lord of your life and Lord of my life because there's a lot of people and unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people, as he said, they said, Lord, Lord. And he goes, I, I don't know you. Not in that context, not under that definition. So they profess to know God. And we've met a lot of people. You can go around and see how many people you could talk to. They believe in God. But it says by their living, by their works. And then, of course, it's described in some pretty tragic terms of abominable disobedient and disqualified that's the way it is brings us to chapter 2 verse 1 he says but as for you speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine when you think of doctrine you think of the doctrine maybe you know and that's the word we think of the doctrine of salvation the doctrine of the trinity the doctrine of atonement, you know, those big, powerful theological concepts in the Bible that are that are incredible. But you're going to see here that 
Paul's going to start talking about you, us, people within the church, and what we believe and live by has to be sound doctrine. That too is doctrine. That is guiding belief in our lives. Back at verse 13, once again, he said, The testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. The word sound, you could say, is healthy. Like the human body has to be healthy, the spiritual body has to be healthy. Healthy in the faith, healthy in the beliefs that we have. And so right here, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. I need somebody to turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Who wants to read it? Go ahead, Mike. You there? You know it by heart, too. I know that. Go for it. Got to get it all right, though, if we're quoting. Bingo. That's it. Present your bodies a living sacrifice and do not be conformed to this world. We came out of this world and were conformed to the world. We, we had beliefs based upon our culture. Now we come to the Lord and we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I need new information up here. The information I have up here says this about whatever the subject might be. I need to be changed in the way I live, but this has to be changed in what it believes. New information has to come in. Where do you get that information from? Amen, Dan. Book right in front of you, the Word of God. That's the information. I need reprogramming. I need a download of the Word of God in my mind. And when I get the Word of God, I see it differently. And now, as I believe by faith in the Word, it begins to transform my life. I relate to things differently. I see things differently. I behave differently differently the culture that we live in has its beliefs and its behaviors right they're ever changing we are in an ever rapidly changing culture but those things are always out there and they're very strong in promoting them i mean it, it, it it's a, it's constant I, I keep getting information that i have to reject from the culture that comes in on on what's okay what's right What's true? What's this? What's that? Here's the definition of this. Here's the definition of that. And I have to say lies. Lies. Because I've already read what is true about that subject. And it's right here. What you're telling me contradicts this. Goes against this. So I have to say a lie. And I have to reject that thing. But you're going to find that that's true for you. Because Jesus has the beliefs and the behaviors for your life. And for my life. And it covers the full spectrum of everything you are. We got a group of, this is a men's study. So we're men. It's going to tell you what a man is. It's going to tell you how a man behaves. If you're a married man, it's going to tell you what you look like as a married man. Not according to the culture, but according to the word of God. Your dad, it's going to tell you how to be a godly dad. A man of God dad. Not what the culture says a dad looks like is. A worker, you're not retired yet. Most of you guys are. But it's going to tell you, if you're in the workforce, how to be a worker. Not how the world does work. Not what's okay out there in the world. But there's an ethic that God gives for the working man that is much higher than that of the world. It, it should be giving more than what the world even expects. And so you could take that anywhere in your life as a man, and whatever you do in relationship to other people and to the world you live in, he has a belief and a behavior for you. It's all covered right here in the Word. He leaves nothing out. And so that's what we have to do, knowing that the culture has its own too. As our culture is moving further away from the Word of God, your life and my life as believers is going to be definitively different. It's going to stand out. You're going to stand out a lot more. I think some believers don't want to stand out. They don't want to be seen as that different from the culture. But we are. 
and we have to be. We have to hold ground. We have to be proud of who we are. Can't be embarrassed. Can't be embarrassed by what you believe. Can't be embarrassed by what the Word of God says. I, I listen to some Bible teaching sometimes, and I'll hear the teacher crossing a subject that is controversial, and I just, inside, I just, as I listen to him teach, I go, why are you being apologetic about that subject? Why are you presenting that with almost saying, I'm sorry it says this in the Bible right here. And the reason why he is doing that is because his culture is saying, no good, no good. And some of the people in his congregation see that truth through the lens of the culture. Remember we talked about that last week? When you look at your culture and what they believe, you have to look at it through the lens of the word of God. And the lens of the Word of God will tell you what is true and right in that culture. And you do things based upon what you see in the Word. If you look through the lens of your culture and you see what the Word of God says, you're going to want to either reject what the Word of God says or you're going to want to make it adapt to your cultural worldview. And that's what's happening with some people. And that's why sometimes when ministers are giving the Word of God and, and I hear that kind of, backpedaling and they're trying to approach it in a way where they're trying not to offend because they know people are going to be offended because they know even in the church people are holding to cultural world views on titles and subjects and you just you speak the truth in love you don't have to be rude you don't have to you know just slap people in the face with the word but you still have to present the word and be unashamed of the word of god remember what paul said at the beginning of second timothy Timothy, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, neither of me his prisoner. He said to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and to the Greek. So we're not to be ashamed of the gospel. We're not to be ashamed of the word. We're not to be ashamed of all the doctrines that are within the word of God that describe what is right to believe and how to behave. So you're, you're going to find yourself in a conversation with your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your best buddy you haven't seen for seven years, people at your high school reunion, your sports buddy, your golf buddy, your hunting buddy, your new neighbor, the guy you work with. You're going to get into a conversation, and that subject, whatever it might be, is going to kind of come up. And they might even say, can you believe these guys believe this kind of stuff? Isn't that ridiculous? And you're going to realize, I'm one of those ridiculous guys. And the reason why I believe is because God says so in his word. And I try to encourage you guys, don't say, well, this is what I believe. Because you know what? They give a rip what you believe. This is what they believe, what you believe. So what? What you want to say is, well, this is what the word of God says. That's why I follow that, because God said so. Let them argue with God. <laughs> don't, don't let them. They will argue with you. Okay, when they come out, they win. Let them argue with God. Let them say, I don't believe God says that. Then you can say, do you mind looking in the Bible with me? I mean, I'd be glad to show you what God said. They can call God a liar. That's up to them, but we know that's not true because we covered that already in our earlier study, right? It's impossible for God to lie. So, again, you're, you're going to run across that kind of stuff and... Um, your culture is trying to conform you, okay? The Word of God is to conform you. Don't be conformed to the culture. We're not to be conformed to the world. We're not to be friends with the world because friendship with the world is enmity with God. You've made yourself an enemy of God. John said, do not love the world, neither the things in the world. Because those that love the world don't love the Father. But they're trying to conform you through the pressure and the tactics are good the pressure is tough the world is is gaining ground gaining momentum they're knocking people within the church down left and right man they're they're coming at it in a different way and they're not just saying hey you got to let me be who i am they're saying you better believe it like i believe it or else and so the word is the world is hostile your culture is hostile they want to conform you Never be conformed, brother. So he's got to bring these things about, as he says. Speak these things which are proper for sound doctrine. As opposed to what those guys are teaching and what some of the Cretan church people are believing, it's got to be sound doctrine. 
And that's our goal as pastors, is to teach with the purpose of transforming the lives of the listeners with God's Word. That's our goal, to bring the Word, to present the Word, that it might transform, if need be, how you see something. The longer you're in the Lord, there's less to transform because you've already conformed to the will of God. You're proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The newer you are, the more information that you're going to get. I know when I was a young believer and what I was hearing and what I was reading in the Bible, I was blown away. I read stuff in the Bible I couldn't believe was in the Bible. <gasps> I used to read about that stuff in the dirty magazines I used to buy. I'm serious. When I read about bestiality in the Bible, and I said, crying out loud, that's in the Bible? you got to be kidding me. I said, yeah, that's sin. I put it in my word. I'm just going to let you know that is just wrong. Wow. <sighs> Blew my mind, as well as a lot of other things that are in the Bible. And so that's why we bring the word. That's why we teach the whole Bible. The doctrine that we're studying here on these five groups that Paul is writing to is as important as the doctrine of salvation. And why is it important? Because if we don't believe in the doctrine of a changed life, we can believe all we want in the doctrine of salvation, but if our life is not changed and we're still living like the culture, what they're saying is, well, if your faith in God gets you to heaven and you live like me, why do I need to change? Or, well, gosh, if all I have to do is have a mental agreement that Jesus is Lord, if all I have to do is believe in here he rose from the dead, if that's all it takes, because I see the way you live, I'm there already, man. This is all good. I like this. That's a great religion, by the way. You know, Jesus the Savior is wonderful. Jesus has to be Savior and, thank you, Lord. There's that word, the ultimate authority. There it is. It has to be both. He's the Savior. That's, I want him to be my Lord. He can't just be a Savior and gets me out of hell, but he's not Lord of my life. I'm still living the way I want to live. And so the doctrines that we're looking at is important. Again, we'll be like the people who say they know God, but by their works and their life and their behavior, they deny him. It's like he's not the Lord. We saw there at the end of uh, uh, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy where Paul said to preach the word, and he charged Timothy before God and Jesus because he knew that there was going to be a time when they won't endure sound doctrine according to their desires. They have itching ears. They're going to heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and they'll be turned aside to fables, to lies, to things that are not true. And so this is why we have to teach the truth. We can teach the truth, but the one listening has to accept the truth. There has to be a connect. How often did Jesus say in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation, let he who has an ear hear. Those who want to hear what I have to hear, hear it. He who has an ear. They're, he's not saying physically. It's interesting. He gave us two of them. For some reason, one breaks down like, you know, you got a second one right there. And by the advancement of hearing aids, praise God, if now you get some of those in and listen. But that's not what he's talked about. He's talking about a spiritual ear. Do you have an ear to hear what I'm saying? Are you willing to listen to me and believe me? There are a lot of people who hear the audible word of Jesus and they close their ears and they close their heart. And they won't listen to it. They won't have it. So we have to, to, to believe this stuff. And we have to believe his message. What they want to do is they want to alter the message again today and have done so, it becomes less biblical, less godly, less offensive, less intrusive. As the culture becomes more self-centered in some churches, so does the message. The message becomes more about me, my desires, my wants, my needs. Back in chapter 3, remember, as Paul said, in the last days, perilous times are going to come. As I told you when we studied there that he's not talking about the world. Although the culture influences, but he says they've got a form of godliness, but they deny the power. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. He's talking about what's supposed to be the church. That's why it's perilous. That's why it's so dangerous. 
because these guys believe they're believers. And he says men are going to be lovers of themselves and finally they become lovers of pleasure pleasure rather than lovers of God. And, and that's a self-centered church. It's a self-centered believer. The, the way they see God and the way God works and the person of God is, is really there to meet their need. It's about me. It's about my life. It's about how God will bless me and what God will do for me and how I want God to work and relate to me. I'm not opening up this book to find out what does God say about it all. I'm trying to find out from this book how I can see this book meeting my need. And and we've seen that. You know, Pastor Gary was talking about that a little bit, about all the books that you can get out there. You know, if you go to the self-help section, in Christian bookstores, there's a plethora of writings out there. When you start reading what they're writing, you will find the same stuff in secular books that have nothing to do with Christianity. They're using the same techniques and philosophies and theories of the world as though at some point in time God failed to put in this word, as Peter said, everything that pertains to life and to godliness by being partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the lust which is in the world. Everything is there. God's God's got you covered. And the Holy Spirit comes with it. The wonderful counselor. Love it. So again, the the culture has influenced the church. We're going to see here, beginning with verse 2, five groups of people. Let's start off with the first one, the older men. Then we're going to get to the older women, and then to the younger women, And then to the young men, and I think not till next week, we're going to get to the bond servants, the slaves, or we can transform that over to to employees if you want to. He starts off, notice that the older men, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, colon, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older men, who qualifies right there? Raise your hand. Way to go, Bob. Come on, Chris. You've got to be the oldest guy here. What are you talking about? Be proud. I believe Paul's writing to the older men because the older men are essential to the body of Jesus Christ. Our culture is no longer respecting age. Our <laughs> Put that guy in the corner of that stool over there. But our culture is doing that. Our our culture no longer honors the age. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus, it said, if a gray-haired man enters your assembly, what were the people to do? Stand up. Imagine if we practiced that. Of course, in this church, nobody would be sitting down. But still, you understand what I mean? Could you imagine walking into a high school room and the whole class gets up? Hello, Mr. Better. You don't even have hair, so they won't know you're gray-haired, but... Hey, Mr. Cowley. <laughs> but could, would you, um, when you read what the, the Bible says, it says you honor your mom and your father. First commandment with the promise, number five. What would happen if you cursed your mom or your dad or you struck your mom or your dad? They take you out, man. That's your life. God is very serious about respect to the elderly. And to the older. When I say the elderly, I don't mean people who are non functional, okay? I'm just saying the older folk, us, people in years, we, we've got years under our belt. And here Paul talks first to the older men, and I want to encourage you guys because I think the church is buying into the cultural mindset too. You know, the church is running long and hard, and I understand part of it is we're not seeing the youth in our churches, and we want to reach them. But never never to the neglect or to somehow set aside the fact that the older men are in the church. Even more so today, the older men are necessary in the church because you men, especially from the era that you came out of, we came out of a time when our world, the United States of America, was a Christian nation and a different culture. And it transitioned in my my lifetime, my generation, the 60s, was a radical change in this culture. You can see the seeds of it and the plants growing in the 50s, but the 60s were revolutionary, all for the worst. 
all the movements in our culture the worst. And we saw the reaction of the culture against it initially, but now all of those young reactionaries now are the shakers, the movers, the leaders, and the educators of our culture. And, and we've seen it change radically. We need to be here to let the younger men that are coming into the church, those 30s and 20s and teen guys, and sometimes the guys in the 40s, we need to be here, the older men, to let them know this is the word of God. This is where we need to be going. This is where we, we need to stay on track. The older men need to be here to lead. And so like I said, I've been listening now, even within the Calvary movement, because the Calvary movement really formed out of the young hippies, the disgruntled, the discontent with the culture. And so they resorted to the drug revolution, the sex revolution, the generation gap. They revolted against their parents and the older society. They were anti-establishment, the government. They are against everything, the Nam War, the this, that. And a lot of them found out that, you know, those things that they were against and what they were for didn't satisfy, but they came to Jesus. And those guys have grown up and we've become pastors. And we're not seeing that same cycle. And so we want to reach the youth. It's my opinion that our culture is affecting our youth different than it did then. And I believe part of it's the social media thing that is going on. Our kids are, are listening to voices in their bedroom, wherever they're at, versus their parents. I think everything that went on in the generation gap has really exponentially, exp youth just think, adults, and culture shows in the sitcoms that adults and dads are stupid, and parents are dumb and out of touch and out of tune. Our culture's wickedness has grown so much. And so the reason is not what the church is doing. The reason is the culture is getting to the kids. And we can do all these cool and groovy things that I see going on out there. But I'll tell you what, it always reminds me of what Pastor Chuck said, man. And he told us, Zechariah 4.16, it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by my Holy Spirit. It's not by church planning, and it's not by relevancy, and it's not by the cooler band that you have, and the greater facility, and the more hit leadership that you have. It's by none of those things. And I see guys starting to try to do those things to somehow show the kids, hey, you want to be here? Pastor Chuck, as I shared with you, was what? 90 by 90 by 90. He was nothing but square. And the Holy Spirit, through this square dude, reached the hippies and was used in a mighty way by the Spirit of God. And I'm convinced that's the only way we're going to reach the culture today. And if that doesn't do it, nothing else will. If, if we're trying to reach them through scheming and planning and, and doing all this because we think that's going to do it, I, I think we're missing it. If we're not praying... Genuinely, if we're not holding fast to the word truly, if we're not loving these kids honestly, sincerely, then everything else is a waste of time, and we're wasting our time. You're wasting it. You might as well just be into your own faith, wait for Jesus to come and go up in the rapture. But if we honestly want to reach the youth, and I do, I want to use the things that God told us to use, and if we can't reach them through that, nothing else will do it. So I'm not interested in trying all the other trickery and, and relevancy and cool and grooviness. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw out some stuff. You know, I'm going to go get that haircut so that I can show them I'm relative. I'm going to tap me a sleeve down like I see pastors doing now because when I'm up here preaching, I show them that. All my tats are pre-Christ. They're, you know, they're BC. They're almost all. I got three crosses on the left side of my body, gang affiliated. Can you believe that? So, you know, the stuff that I have, and I'm not making statements on that, but I'm telling you, I'm, I'm seeing them do this stuff because that's cool in the culture. These are the things that the culture is doing. And so we want to be relevant to these kids. No, no. You know, when they look up there, they should just see a genuine Bible-based man of God who loves them and will pray for them. And they will love that. That's what we need today. So the, you as the older men, I want to encourage you. If you're retired from work, that's fine. God bless you guys. I, I told you I'm jealous. Except my job is great, so I shouldn't be jealous of nothing. 
But don't retire. Don't be out of service in the kingdom of God. Don't think because you're retired and you're getting a check now, automatic deposit, you've got yourself covered to death, that you're done. Don't think because you're old and you don't move as fast and you don't know the lingo that somehow you are out of touch with the young kids. Don't believe that for a minute, guys. Don't believe it. Just believe that, you know what? God has called me to be a man of God. God wants to use me as a man of God. I'm in the Bible. There's men of God throughout the Bible that were old. Paul the Apostle's in his mid-60s, right here, writing to Titus. And he doesn't feel like, well, you know, I'm going to turn the ministry over to you guys because I'm an old guy. Are you kidding me? you got to kill this guy to stop him. That's what they did. But he didn't. There's, there's guys retiring from the ministry today because they're getting older. I don't read that in my Bible. I don't see that as a biblical pattern. That's God didn't say, you know, here's my plan. Once you get to be old, you can't walk, and you're not as fast, and and you're out of there. No. I mean, if you're physically incapable, I get it. If you're mentally not, I get it. But you know what? As long as the Holy Spirit and the Word of God can work through you, stay in the game, man. Stay in the game, brother. See where the Lord will use you. He will use you. So he says for the older men. Oh, I wanted to read you Isaiah 3.12. I came across this verse. I, I never hear it quoted. I came across it a lot of years ago. And when you read the first several chapters of Isaiah, there's some incredible rebuke from the Lord. But, but listen to this. This is what he says. Tell me if this isn't interesting. What happened to them then and the way it is now. He says, as for my people, children are their oppressors. That means the youth is oppressive and women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. And he said in chapter 3, verse 4, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. The people will be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. The child will be insolent toward the elder and the base toward the honorable. Children will be their oppressors, and women rule over them. God has called the men to lead within the church. But in our culture, in the feminist movement, we've seen that today. Could you imagine me sharing these things on The View? How many of you are familiar with what The View is? A bunch of gals sit around and talk about the issues of life. They would call me a knuckle-dragging, chauvinistic, Victorian, barbaric, out of touch. I say, well, that's just what God said. I give no apologies. God's called the men to lead and the older men first. That is our job because what happens when we stop doing that, Children will become our oppressors. I see that in the market line. I see a three-year-old kid beating on a man who's six foot, 220 pounds, and he's just kind of going like this. Are you kidding me? The way kids talk to their parents and treat their parents today, are you kidding me? That's right there in the Bible. God said, when my people in the book of Isaiah is telling the people, you're, you're off track, get back. And, and you got women ruling over you now. They're telling you what to do. What happened to the male leadership that God ordained. God ordained the men to lead in the marriage, the men to lead in the family, the men to lead in the church, and I believe by example, Old and New Testament, the men to lead in government. That's why you have Pamela Harris's and Nancy Pelosi's out there. If you study the political positions of the females in governmental offices, the vast majority will hold to a pro-abortion and a pro-homosexual agenda. Because that's, that's their background. And they're the ones who are leading our nation. And they're in the offices that are getting the laws in our country changed. That means the men aren't good. There's a lot of bad men in there too. Okay? That doesn't mean that you know, if men lead, everything will be hunky-dory. There are plenty of bad men leaders. But it's still something that God has ordained. That the men lead, and I believe by the fact that there were older men, we should be wise in life and wise in the word. We're past that period of youth. We're past the season of foolishness. We've learned. I loved the 30s. The 30s, you still had your good strength as a man, but it seemed like you got done with all the stuff that you had to learn and go through in the 20s. And, and there was still some what we might even call just youth and foolishness and lack of wisdom in your 20s as you're trying to figure out life. You're trying to figure out marriage. You're trying to figure out 
family, you're trying to figure out your vocation, your career, your, who you, you know, where you're going in life. And by the 30s, man, you, you should have the plane kind of going straight now and you got your altitude okay. And now your ailerons are set and, and you see on the horizon where you're going. All right, now we're, we're flying a little better. When you, as you get older, it should be even more fine-tuned in our lives. We learn more. Sometimes we learn by study. You get in the Word of God, you learn wisdom by study. Sometimes you learn by observation. Oh my gosh, I saw what he did. I ain't doing that. And then sometimes we learn by experience. I am the guy who somebody said, I ain't doing that. Look at Gil. That was stupid. So we learn, but we come to a place in life where as we go through life, we've learned so much, we're not making all the same mistakes anymore. We're understanding it better. So very important, I believe. It says we're to be sober. And it's used there, the idea of sober, not intoxicated, but it's used figuratively. And the idea is you're clear-minded. Your mind is not controlled by something else. How many of you have ever been drunk in this room before? Okay, you know when you get drunk, you don't think clearly any longer. And that's the idea, and that's why he speaks figuratively. Don't be intoxicated with the things of the world, the things of culture, or with yourself. See life and see where you're going clearly. Clearly see the truth. That means at our age, we should no longer be influenced by our culture. Their tricks should no longer trick us. Their schemes should no longer catch us. They can't buy us any longer with what they throw out there. You know, we, we've been around the block, right? You know that little proverb, you know, you've been around the block. Now you're going around the block again. You should know what you're going to run into because you've been around the block. You know what to anticipate. So you, you should be a sober-minded, a clear-minded man in the things of God says you should be reverent. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought those were the pastors called reverent. Somebody along the road, because that should be a character of a pastor, tag that onto his name probably. And in some circles, you could be called the right reverend. And if you're really up there, you're the most right reverend. That's what's on your title in front of your name. Give me a break. That's not Jesus at all. But the idea here, as he says, you're supposed to be reverent. It just means you're honorable, you're respected in character, you're reverent. You behave in a dignified way, you're wise in your years. Foolishness doesn't pop out anymore in life. You know better. You know how to act in public. You know how to act with people. You know how to act in situations. You handle yourself. You're in control of yourself. Foolishness, it's for the young kids. It's for the ignorant men. But it's not for you any longer. Your behavior is reverent. And again, you've learned that godly wisdom by study, by observation, by experience. And now you know how to handle yourself. Temperate means you're self-controlled. You keep to your senses. You stay balanced in your behavior. You control yourself, and you don't allow yourself to do what would not be reverent. So temperate, you're a man of, of self-control. You know when your flesh wants to go in a direction, and you're capable of managing it and keeping it going straight. Whereas when you were younger, you just went with it. You, you know, you hit the gas pedal when you started veering off, you know. I'm going to hit that curve real strong. Now it's like, I'm not taking that turn anymore. I'm going to keep it straight, man. Straight ahead. So another characteristic for us will be temperate. Then we're to be sound in the faith. It means you're healthy in the faith. Like sound doctrine, you have sound faith. You're strong in the faith of God. As you're older, you've learned to trust God in difficult situations. You're not like a young person who gets scared right away. I think of my dad when he talked about fighting the Nazis in Europe. And when they would be digging in, foxholes were the real deal things in Europe. You know, that's where, where they dug foxholes. You'd get to a place and you'd have to dig in. The enemy was coming. He said the Germans love to get you in a crossfire. They always tried to catch you, and not straight across, okay? They would catch you at an angle, he said. And then when the Messerschmitts would come through and they would strafe because they can get you in the foxholes and they would strafe the ground. Guys would get scared and pop out of their foxholes, the newer guys, the younger guys. 
He said, you got to stay in the foxhole. If you're going to die, you're going to die in the foxhole. You come out of the foxhole, crossfire will kill you, the measure Smith will shoot you. You're a dead man. So, you know, it's the same thing. You, you just got to trust your foxhole. And when the bullets are flying in your life, you can't be like the young guys who get up. You just have to say, you know what? The Lord said, Gil, stay in your foxhole. Stay in your foxhole, you won't get hit. My foxhole of faith. I like that statement. There's no atheists in foxholes. Men were praying, God, save my life, man. That's that's the whole idea. My dad talked about those story. I, I get it now when I hear those statements. Oh, that's what they mean right there. But you're you're an older man. You got to be. You don't surrender to doubt. You hold on to the promises of God. Not like when you were younger. You took it into your own hands. You're gonna make it work. You'll take care of this. God ain't gonna show up. I'm always here. You know better than that now. So we're strong in the faith. We're sound in the faith. We're sound in love. That means you're healthy, you're strong, and godly love. You exercise your love toward your brethren, your neighbor, your stranger, and your enemy. That's when you're strong in love. When you could love your enemy, when you could pray for them, when you could do good to them, and when you can bless them, is what Jesus said to your enemy. When you do that, you're strong in love, you're sound in love. When you could love those that love you, Jesus says, what credit is that to you? Sinners can do that. Big deal. Oh, I love this brother. He just blessed me the other day. You know what he did for me? Oh, I love him. Of course, who wouldn't? But while that brother was supposed to have done this, he didn't do that. In fact, he did just the opposite. Man, does that tick you off? Well, I wasn't happy about it, but that's my brother, and I love him anyways. It's life. Things like that happen. I love him. It's a whole different behavior, right? And so we got to be strong and love as older guys in the Lord. Got to love the unbeliever. We love that unbeliever. We want to win him to Jesus. We understand the necessity of godly love in our life. And I think we know that Paul says, you could do a lot of things in the name of Jesus that you think are spiritual. But if you lack love, all you're doing is making a lot of noise and it adds up to nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the first three verses. You can give your body to be burned. You ain't got love. All you did was get burned. No big deal. No points in heaven. Accomplished nothing. So love is important. We've got to be sound in patience, and that's perseverance. We're not easily or quickly discouraged by the situation or the circumstance. We're long-suffering with people and problems. We're confident in the Lord, and we wait on God in His timing. Patience is always a challenging one. But when you have your eyes on the Lord and not on the people or the problem, then your patience will be waiting in the hand of God and the work of God. When we look to the people, then we're going to get frustrated. Or the circumstance, then we're going to lose patience. So those are six characteristics of the man of God. Any questions, thoughts, comments, rebuttals before we move into the old women? Enough there, huh? Verse 3 through 5. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women. So the, the older women in the church should, likewise, they should possess the same virtues. The older women are also seasoned in life, have grown. And again, older is the idea of mature, developed. Not just decrepit, aged, (laughs) non-functional, body parts aren't working. The idea is is that foolishness of youth is, is not there and you don't lack wisdom. I think you would agree with me. There is nothing like a godly, mature, wise Christian woman. I mean... They're, they're a thing of beauty. They're a thing of that you respect and you honor. You treat her like your mom. Man, you open the door for her. I mean, we should open it for all. But, you know, when you get a godly, mature, older woman that loves the Lord and lives within the virtues of her calling, man, she is just, there's just, there's nothing to compare. And I think of what the women want to accomplish today in the world. They want that position. They want that power. They want that recognition. 
but they're going about it the wrong way, and they're still fighting to get there. But God says it's the older woman. She is a, a model of virtue. She has an inner beauty. There is love and care and compassion. The opposite is the woman of shame, disrespect, and confusion. There's a lot of them women. Just, just watch them. Don't watch them. You'll see them. They, they just pop up, man, like a pimple on a teenager's face. They're big and ugly, and they show up. And the thing that these women do, and they're famous, and they're well-known, and they're icons in the music industry, and the movie industry, and you watch their behavior, and you go, there's nothing to respect in that woman. She should be ashamed. She should be embarrassed the way she's behaving in public. And everybody's applauding her, and they think she's it, man, and they're going to review her, and she's the happening thing. You want to be like her. And I just, I, I would think, sure glad that ain't my mom. Sure glad it's not her. But the, the culture has lost their conscience. They don't have much shame. What is she supposed to be like? Well, says the older women, they also are to be reverent in behavior, just like the men. There, you want equality with a man? There you go. Reverence, God said. I want you to be just, just like the guys and have that kind of a, a dignity in public. You present yourself correctly in public. A lot of the female public figures want to present themselves as sex symbols. They dress immodestly they behave sensually that's how they're trying to get their respect god says no you do it in a reverent fashion she's not to be noticed as a slanderer she's not to be an accuser a malicious gossip she's not given to express her feelings about others slanderously men can tend to be abusive physically women can be abusive with their tongue. That's what the Bible said about the young widows. They're, the young widows, they go about busy body gossiping and, you know, let them get remarried and take care of the home and family. Don't just give them that freedom. They say women will talk seven times as much as a guy, and some of you guys, your wives beat you by twice that amount. And because the Bible says sin is lot, not lacking in the multitude of words, and a woman wants to express her feelings, and she will do it audibly. She has more of the potential. Not that we don't get ourselves in trouble with our mouth. We know how to get two good feet in one mouth at any given moment. But she has a propensity to do that because she's going to talk, and she's going to share her feelings, and she's going to talk about, you know, with her friends and things like this. And, and it's easy. Slander can come out. And, and some of these talk shows, again, you listen to them in. Man, they're just slanderous. That's what they do. That's what people love in uh, reality shows. That's what they do. That's what they love. That's why they get high ratings, because people are on there just slandering each other. My mom had a saying, and she told me as I grew up, and it's actually my stepmom, but I call her mom. You might have the same mom as I did. Raise your hand if you do. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. Anybody's mom say that? Crud, I had more brothers than I thought. Dang. Yeah. You know what? In all the years that I was with my mom, I saw her violate that principle one time. One time. One time my mom violated it. And when she did, she had good reason to because somebody did her wrong. Normally she'd just say, oh, I can't believe what they did. I just, I, I'm not going to say. And that would be it. She would just give that little puff of steam, let you know she's upset, and she controlled her lips. And she would tell me that if you don't have nothing good to say, I wish I could say I only did it 100 times. I'm sure I violated her principle. And if she hadn't told me that, it would be even worse. And if the Word of God hadn't told me it, I'd be like what he's talking about right here but not to be slanders. It says in Proverbs 31, 26, this virtuous woman, she opens her mouth in wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. That's how a woman should be. It's how a woman should speak. I'm not preaching to the choir here, but that's what the scripture says. She's not given to much wine. Nothing worse than a wine old woman, huh? <laughs> she's not a woman who trusts to drink and she controls herself if she has any at all. She's not given to much. 
She doesn't need us to take care of her problems. She has a faith in God. She's protecting her reverent behavior by avoiding an excess that would cause her to lose self-control. It says she's to be a teacher of good things. She's to teach other women. She's to teach the younger women. She's to teach her children. And she can teach other children. And then she teaches them the good things as she's practicing herself already. And you can go back to 1 Timothy chapter 5 when it talks about the widows. And it says if you're going to take a widow into the number of the church and you're going to financially support her, she has to be at least 60 years old. And then there's some things that she has to be known for. That she is a godly woman. That she practices good things and she is taught good things. And that's her responsibility there. She understands the importance of teaching and discipling the younger women. She wants to pass it on. When you hear of women's conferences and women's writings and women's books, there are some things in them books you just don't seem to see. You don't hear about. The older women are to teach younger women. And here it is what they're to teach them. Notice this. We're going to move for the older women. They're to admonish, admonish the young women. This is what the older women do. Now teach the younger women to do this, to love their husbands and to love their children. Love their husbands. What's your job? Your job is to love your husband. That's your main ministry. That's your main responsibility. And you're to love your kids. That's the first thing you need to do. Our culture teaches battle of the sexes, competition, equality. Redefinition of the marriage structure. And so we, we've seen a lot of the, the, the changing of those kinds of things that has come from our culture. They've argued it very strongly. They're very effective. She loves her husband because it brings strength into the marriage. When a man knows and feels that love of a wife, he reciprocates. He does become a better husband and a better man. Some of the best men are made because they've got great wives. They've got women who know how to be a wife and they will love their husband. You see men frustrated sometimes in marriage. And you listen to them and they've got a relationship where they're in conflict with their wife because she wants to be the co-boss and in competition. And the question is, are you loving your husband biblically? Well, of course I am. That idiot would understand. And you go, okay, well, I don't think we're, 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 we're meaning the same thing here. And she loves her children. She understands what it means for a mother to love a child and how vital she is in the development of the young child. She carried that thing in her womb for nine months what an honor and a privilege and an incredible thing i always think what is it like for a woman to lay there and feel that little thing kicking and to realize we hear them tell us that right but that doesn't help me what is it really like to know you've got a life in you a whole human beings in you and then one day as plop comes out and you get to play with dolls but the doll's real girls like dolls why because you want to be a mama someday it's in their being and in their dna and now they got this child and now they've got to raise this child. And their influence and their love is going to shape that child in its, in its infancy more than the dad. So the mom has to love the child. And she loves the child and she loves her husband, first because God commands her, secondly because she understands the role she plays in both of their spiritual development. She understands it. Today, like I say, the culture is just saying there's a competition. There needs to be equality. There needs to be this. There needs to be... And so she, she, she's in a competition with her husband. She's to be discreet, to be chaste. That is, that word discreet, again, it's the idea of sober, and she's to be modest. She, too, carries herself with good judgment and with a clear mind. And the modesty, as we saw in 1 Timothy 2.9, that the woman should dress with modesty and purity in mind. She stresses an inner beauty more than a physical beauty. And you find that first Peter chapter three, verses one through seven, where Paul counsels the women to be submitted to her husband, even to the one who's disobedient to the word, that he, through your chaste and disciplined behavior, without a word spoken, would be brought to God. They'll divert to the word spoken first. The heck with a chaste and disciplined behavior. You're gonna hear it from me, Jack. God says, no, no, that's not going to change the man. And we know how we are as guys, right? That's just a fight. That's just a battle. 
But God says, don't even have to use the word. Let them see your lifestyle. That'll, that'll get a guy. Nothing worse than a woman being more godly and more yielded to God and being more of a witness for the Holy Spirit to come in and go, so you're the man of the house, huh? Wow, you're an impressive punk. Look at your wife over there. Now, the Holy Spirit's never called me a punk, but it's good as that when you behave. It's like, Holy Spirit will get you, man. He'll tell you, man, you're not even the man you're supposed to be right now. And look at that girl and the way you treat her and the way you're behaving. So without a word, she wins. And, and again, the dress modest. And, and again today, understand the people who are setting the trends in the fashion industry are extremely immoral, extremely homosexual and lesbian. Have you noticed in the last 50 years we've gone to unisex everything? That the crossover between distinctly male clothes, distinctly female clothes, went to unisex, but now we've crossed the other way. The men's clothing are becoming more feminine and women's clothing are becoming more masculine. I see guys and I think he's wearing his sister's pants. I think that man has his mother's blouse on. I'm serious. I want to say something. I saw a guy yesterday in Costco in the jacket, and I think the guy was living on the other side of the tracks, if you know what I mean. I looked at that jacket, and I said, that is a chick's jacket. You can't have a cut up to here, short sleeves, and the cute little... It, it. But that's normal, guys. That's the fashion. And the people who are doing it are the people who want to change the culture. And sexy has been in for a long time. As much as you can show... Be as provocative as possible. You could look, but you can't touch. Tragic part is a lot of times you could look and touch. Well, maybe, maybe. And, and we've got it. I hate that part. That's what I love about the winter. Bundle up. Throw on three jackets, girl. Freeze and dress yourself up. I don't want all that junk flashing around all over the place. We can't even go to the store. You know, you got to really be cautious of what you're looking at. You, gotta, you get in line and you get them right in front of you. It's like, let's go to this line over here. The way it is, but that's what the world's teaching them. Women of God shouldn't be doing that. They're to be homemakers and good. It means they're workers at home and they're kind. That's interesting in today's culture, huh? Try to put that on the view too. Women should be homemakers. That's what the Bible calls them to be primarily. She makes the home a retreat. I think of a retreat as where I want to retreat to. I don't want to escape it. I want to go there. It's safe. It's desirable for her family. Home is where the children are raised and taught from infancy. I'm going to step on ground here, but our culture, after World War II, 45, was over. We won. We beat the Nazis. We beat the Empire of Japan. We came out. Both arms were flexed. People were pumped in this country. We can get back to it. And there was a prosperity that hit our nation. Korean War came in there, too, a little bit. But a prosperity hit our nation. And all of a sudden, as we were able to get stuff, something changed where we started going, hey, if you go to work too, we can get more stuff. And households began to send mom out into the workforce. When mom left the home, homemaker, the children went to school. Then they went to the babysitter. The children went to school and then they came home and were called latchkey children. The ch children went to school, then they were dropped off at the daycare center. And what happens is other people began to raise kids. TV began to raise kids. Video games are raising kids. And now you get into social media and all the influence there, and the culture is raising our kids. That's what's been happening for decades. Mom gets home, and guess what? I'm too tired to make dinner. I'm too tired to do this. I don't want to have some kids and stuff like that. Go to your room. Get on your PlayStation. Get on your computer. Leave it alone. Go watch TV. Go play with your friends. And we've been doing that for decades and decades. And we wonder, what has happened to our children today? you got to have a mom there. Dad's got to be there, too. And so he's guilty, too. He, he can get very involved in making money and acquiring things and neglect a lot. But we've seen that right there. And that's why when the Bible says that right there, there's a reason for that. Our culture has changed it dramatically. So she's a good woman, a kind woman. She's a respected woman. And now let me get extremely politically incorrect. She's to be obedient to her husband. 
Nothing more exciting than teaching on submission to your husband in the Bible. As you begin to teach that, you can hear the woman locking and loading. You can get a lot of women very extremely angry with you if you teach just a simple biblical teaching. Wives, you're to submit to your husband because he's the head of the home. You can listen to pastors teach that and start backstepping and sidestepping and becoming apologetic and saying, well, you know, if the husband will love the wife, yeah, and, and, and we want to sedate the women because we know culturally that is probably that in, in the teaching on homosexuality, the two subjects in the church that are going to get you the most ire and the most angry people that there are. But it's taught in many places. So the wife is to be obedient, submitted to her husband. It doesn't mean that he is an autocratic ruler in the home. He's to love his wife. He's to serve her as Christ served the church. Jesus loved the apostles, but the apostles never told Jesus what to do. Peter tried that one time, right? And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You got the things of man on your mind, not the things of God, buddy. Jesus was the head of the church. But he loved the church, and so we're to love our wives. It doesn't mean that, you know, we just run around and just shove them and push them and act mean. I like to sit down and, and, and discuss things with my wife. I want her, in, I respect her. And I like to, you know what I mean, get to that stuff, and she sees where my weaknesses are. And so it, we're a team. I think you, you build that team. But there's going to be places, especially in the spiritual realm, where you have a responsibility as the man of God and the man of the home and you have to say, this is where we need to go. And if you get to the place where she realizes, you know, you're black, she's white, then it's going to be, it's going to be black. And, and, and I'm going to trust God to give you the wisdom to handle this. And if not, then I'll trust God to, to, to fix it. And that's what she has to do. She can't dig in her heels and say, no, we ain't going to happen this way. I ain't going to go there. So Paul the Apostle says right there that the older women who should be obedient to their husbands or teach the younger women, and they do that, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. There's a consequence to following the culture. The culture blasphemes the word of God enough already. So when we don't live that, and when wives aren't submitted to their husbands, it gives the enemy occasion to blaspheme the word of God. There's a consequence to that. There are some who teach that when Christ died, and they'll go to Galatians where Paul said, In Christ Jesus there's neither Greek nor Jew, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor bond, male or female. Therefore, there's equality of the sexes. No, that's the way God looks at his children and his family and salvation. God sees his sons and his daughters. He loves them all the same. He says, well, I'm going to be leaving the house right now. I'll be back to return for you guys. And this is how you're going to behave while I'm gone. This is how I want it to work. It's like when you left your kids, right? You always said the older child usually had responsibility over the younger kids. And so even though you loved everyone, your kids the same, somebody's responsible for management here in this circumstance, this situation. And that's the way it is right here. And so that there should be that. Uh, she should be loving and submitted to her husband. She, and so this woman understands and she abides in the God-given marriage structure. She helps him to love her by submitting and respecting him. If a woman believes that she can compete with her husband and he is going to somehow learn to love her, this doesn't work. It doesn't work. If she wants a browbeat husband, she might get one of those. They're around. A very unattractive couple. Very unattractive when you sit down and you see a couple somewhere and you can see the wife and, and unfortunately, she ends up being a proverb woman. 31? No. No, she's the one who a contentious wife. Better to dwell on a housetop, right, than with a contentious woman. Then it gets worse. Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious woman. A contentious woman is like a continual dripping. There are four or five places in Proverbs where it talks about that woman, the, the one who wants to be the head of the home, the browbeater. And she's not going to get loved the way she wants. She may be in charge, perhaps, but she's not going to be loved the way a woman wants to be loved. When a woman submits to her husband and loves her husband, that'll get what she wants. She wants to be cherished. She wants to be taken care of. She, she, when she has that inner beauty, beauty that Peter talks about, 
she becomes precious to her husband. She's the most precious thing to him. That's how she does it. But the culture is telling her, oh, no, honey, now don't be a doormat. No, we, we did that back in the Victorian era. This is our day. This is our time. Helen Reddy sang it back in the 70s. I am woman, hear me roar, and numbers too big to ignore. And God's telling the women in the church, I want you of a gentle and a quiet spirit because that is most precious in my sight. First Peter chapter 3, verse 6. A gentle and a quiet spirit, not a contentious, combative woman, not a roaring woman, but a gentle and a quiet. That's enough for tonight, guys. We still got the young men and the servants. Lord willing, we will do that next week. Questions, thoughts, comments, rebuttals, opinions. Dave. Yep, that's mission. What's really cool, and, I, and I, when he said, I think of, of marriage and, and God has called the man to be the, the husband and the head and the chief discipliner, and he calls the wife to be the carer and the nurturer. And as a dad, I know what I wanted from my kids, and I see the long-distance goal, and I shoot for that. That's great. That's the way it's supposed to be. The problem is we miss it on the day-by-day day because we've got that goal. Kind of like when we go on vacation, once you got in the, the truck and in the back end of the camper shell, pedal to the metal. I'm hungry. Tough luck. I got to go pee. Don't pee in my truck. You know, we're, we're just, I got the goal. I'm trying to get to South Dakota. The moms, they're into the day by day. They're into the moment by moment. They're in touch with the kids. They got to go pee. They're going to pee in your truck whether you want them. And they're going to pee in their pants. Yeah. You know, all right. All you know. And so they bring that, like you say, you know, they, they, they get that. But a lot of times, the moms, because they're day by day, don't have that long distance view for their kids. They're only concerned about taking care of their kids today. And sometimes they're not tough enough to say, no, this, this is where you're headed right there. Dad knows where we're going, and they help on the day by day. And I find that to be a beautiful design by God. It, it's perfect. You know, they, they take our rough edges off of us, and they smooth us out. You know, and it's a, a potato sack race, right? A marriage is a potato sack race. The guy and the gal are both in the sack, but where's your arm? Your arm is around under her, right? And you're in the race, and she's got her arm around the hip, and you're carrying her as you're moving along, and you're, and you're trying to help her with the balance, and you're going together. Now, when you want to run ahead, you're going to trip. And when she wants to run in her own direction, you're going to trip, and you're going to lose the race. But when we run the potato sack race, if you will, the way God teaches us to, It'll be a lot of fun. People don't do that anymore. Go home, try that this week, and tell me how it went next Monday. <laughs> Probably have to see your doctor afterwards, huh? Anyone else with a thought or comment? Obviously, I have a lot of opinion on the subject. There you go. Exactly. Yep. It does. On the 31st, Secretary of State Blinken signed into order the change in passports. Instead of the old days where you wrote male or female, and if you weren't sure, you'd have to have a medical certificate that declared what you were at birth and you had to mark that but because we want to be sensitive to everybody in our culture now you those of you who don't know what you are or choose to be other than what you are could put your little x in that block i don't know what the other countries are going to do when you get there i think there's some countries where they ain't going to put up with that but it's that same change where we're trying to accommodate the new cultural thinking and and there are people within churches that have family members who are buying into that because they love them and they don't want nobody to be mean to them and hate them then they're protecting them and you know and 
And I think when Jesus said, I didn't came, come to bring peace, but a sword. And I'll set a son against his dad. I'll set a mother against her daughter. And your enemies will be within your own household. Because you hold my truth, people in your own family will hate you. But what's happening right now, people are going, no, no, no. I, I'm holding on to my family member. I got Jesus too. Oh, I can't do both. I can't do both. Uh-huh. I want to be in your shoes. They're talking up to 28 days after birth. They're trying to get that legalized. We're talking third trimester brutality. Now they're talking about post-birth. That's worshiping Moloch. In the Old Testament, you read about Moloch. It was a god that had his hands out, and they would heat the god, get his hands hot. And if you had a baby and you didn't want the baby, what's the best thing you could do with that baby? Offer it to God as a sacrifice. We'll get a blessing. Could you imagine sticking that poor child on these burning hot arms of this brass? It, it, and, and now they're talking, they're trying to get us a 28 days after the birth. If, you know, you've got that four-week window, you could decide. Or you could think, you know, my child's got some medical problems and some disabilities. There may be some Down syndrome in there. It'd be best for this little child if we terminate its life. We're barbaric, man. We're brutal. We're, we're worse than them. And I think of what God said, I will give them over to a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. I believe we're in the period of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And you see them doing stuff and you go, that's insanity. They believe a lie. They can't see truth. They, they couldn't understand truth if they went whack, whack. And our culture is like that today. This transgenderism and the protection of it, that whole idea. I mean, I could tell you a bunch of us in Costco one day when I still worked and this guy was six foot two, wearing little white sneakers, bobby socks, shorts. And he was up there, and I looked as he kind of came up, and I thought, can't be a chick. And when he talked, he confirmed it. And I thought to myself, you can't be, dude. I wish I could say that. I wish I could say, dude, you got to be kidding me, man. You are not a chick. You are not, and you'll never be, man. Break away. Be a man. It's all right. But he wanted to be a she, and he made a horrible she. And I just think, what are the dynamics in you that you would go and do that publicly and think somehow you're going to come across as a female when everything is barking, dude, dude here, dude. And I just, it's a strong delusion that they would, yeah. Ah. Okay. Jesus is coming. I just, I grieve, and I'll close with this. I just grieve for your grandchildren and maybe your children who are going to get caught up in this web. When I hear people are not worried about themselves and they just kind of la, 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 I can't be quiet if you think, ah, oh, he talks about that subject a lot. It's your grandkids, my grandkids, man. They're going to get swept into this. The children that we want to come and the youth that we want to be in this church, will not come here because the world is saying if you don't believe what we practice and become like this, you're a hater and your church is a hater. I don't want to go to a hater church. And these kids are hopeless, man. They're falling into it. They're buying into it. It's a growing cultural tragedy, man. And I think that's why the Bible teaching church has to keep that on the front burner, man, as much as it's very unpopular because that is a, such a a strong movement of homosexuality and transgenderism. You know, you had the lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual. Now they got the queer something and a plus on it. I mean, they, they can't even stop. They've got to add something more perverse in every perversity, and it has to be natural, normal, and fully accepted. You know, it's 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 sin, brother. It's 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 the love of sin, the rejection of truth. Father, uh, Lord, we love to close on more exciting subjects, but yet we see this in our culture today. We see its impact, and so we pray tonight as men of God, and Father, ask you to work in us and through us that we might be 
a godly spiritual influence, not just in our church, but in our families and our communities. We ask that you would anoint us with the power of your Holy Spirit to have a wisdom and to have the words that in those moments that we speak, Father, you said when they persecute us, think not beforehand what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will give you the words in that moment. We ask you in the same way to give us the words in those moments, the words of your truth, that we can speak to them, that, Lord, they would see the truth as they're looking through a lie. And, Lord, help us to be prepared for this cultural avalanche that's on our culture and coming into our churches, Lord. We're just being bombarded. And so thank you, Lord, that we're here for such a time as this. Strengthen us, guide us in Jesus' name. Amen.